there you go. You would think after um, 24 months of uh, Zoom every day that you get uh, get this right, but uh, still, still, still work in progress. Um, great, we're uh, super excited here today to, uh, to 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 get all of the insights and thoughts from uh, from Miles. Uh, we had an amazing prep call here, so uh, so everybody in the audience have a lot to um, to, to to look forward to here. Um, I'm Ada Traustal. I'm the founder and CEO of Crisp. Um, so we take uh, data out of all of the the places that that that, that the big brands are selling their products online and offline, and then provide real time sales data and product uh, data to big brands. But much more importantly, we just want to um, hear from you, Miles. You have a important, big new title in a big important <laughs> company. So, what triggered this kind of change here to 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 to, 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 to this title and this this role within Mondelez for you? Sure. I mean, I think the uh, and pleased to meet everybody. Uh, my my title, as you might see, there is um, director of INA Transformation. Uh, but also global insights excellence, and what that means between all of those those words is really responsible for trying to tie together all of the various tools and capabilities that we have, um, so that it is seamless across our insights organization. So, ranging from areas of innovation, pack and product quality, brand health tracking, social listening, um, creative measurement. Um, to try and make that as seamless as possible because our stakeholders, marketers, don't want to see the dots. They want to see the full picture. Um, and that that was really the driver behind sort of some of the role changes that our leadership at, in, in Mondelez were, were, were aiming for to make you know better use of our information, um, but at the same time to uplift our insights and analytics community through better skills, better capabilities, uh, a stronger infrastructure, and a, uh, a more bonded community as well. Great. Um, we'd love to look and learn, understand a little bit kind of what changes um, you saw at Mondelez brands during the pandemic. Kind of, there were probably some brands that thrived and, uh, and some had a harder time just because um, consumer behavior sh shifted a lot uh, during, that, during that time. And also very curious then how that, uh, how, how that triggered actions and change on, on, on your end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, um, as an insights person, it was uh, fascinating to see the shifts in consumer behavior. Um, and I think we can break it into sort of three big buckets. The first is when when COVID hit and there was that heavy lockdown that everybody experienced extreme changes. Now there's sort of the, the new normal or the sustained approach that, that the people are thinking about. And then the third thing is how are the brands ourselves within the, within the Mondelez snacking portfolio performing you know, throughout that entire journey? Initially, I mean, what we're seeing in terms of consumer needs is that elements around being comforted and treated and having those indulgent occasions, they shot right up when, uh, when it came down to the, the, you know, the lockdown period. That was because people felt restricted. They weren't able to go and do and, and, and be in the places they wanted to be. So they started to resort much more to the smaller pleasures, to having a little bit of indulgence here and there. Um, it also didn't didn't uh, didn't deter them in the fact that they were very close to their pantry or to their fridge, um, and and also as as we were stocking up during that time, some of our products became which are sort of the household staple names. They also were part of that sort of immediate shopping list, uh, where in some cases we thought they wouldn't be, and and they actually turned out to be. So, for for a large degree. Um, the needs as well as the context has helped a lot of our brands in terms of how consumers have gone back to some of those those tried and trusted brands uh, but in other places of our portfolio it's actually been more difficult so it's been a bit of a bit of a tale of two cities i would say um, as we as we look at the needs now we've seen almost a steady decline of sort of healthier snacks um, and a, a sort of a continued need over the over the sustained period for that need, for those needs of comfort and treat, um, and in, and it also depends on which country you're at. So, um, in India, those needs of treat and comfort, and Brazil as well. These markets that are still um, significantly affected by COVID and, and lockdowns, those needs remain the same, or they still remain heightened. But in other markets like the US, you're starting to see it sort of begin to normalize. Um, and we're also seeing the the way people shop as well beginning to normalize as well. So 
an interesting take on some of our brands were, uh, you know, when, when, when COVID first hit, we were trying to understand from a forecasting point of view, what kind of volumes we were expected, were they going to fall off a cliff because people were reevaluating all of their purchases. Um, and we were, we thought in the case of Cadbury in, in Australia that people would move away from Cadbury because it was perhaps a bit of a luxury in comparison to when people were stocking up on toilet paper and sanitizers. Um, but actually we found that that was part of their fundamental list of products that they must have in the home. So Cadbury in Australia and, and in other parts of the world really took off. It became the treat that they could turn to. Mm. Here in the US, um, we had a bit of a stronger indication because we, we've always seen, interestingly enough, a, a relationship between Oreo and, and the hurricane season in Florida. So we, we found that sales of, of Oreo really ramp up during, during those periods. So we knew that it was it had the potential to 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 be very welcomed into consumers' homes at that time, but it really took off because it seemed to be that all family product. It's um, it's durable. It's it's obviously got great packaging, um, and it's it's also the brand ethos. I think stands for fun and escapism and joy um, during a time when 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 people were looking for those little pleasures. So Oreo, as a brand. Did, uh, did very well for us. Mm. On the flip side of that, some other brands that we have um, are much more related to being outdoors and to being on the go and to interacting with others. Our gum and candy brands, particularly our refreshing candy brands, those had a much more difficult time as suddenly the context in which consuming gum um, and Trident, our brand, was less relevant because they weren't shopping on the go, which is where the vast majority of our gums are purchased. People weren't interacting with each other. So the one of the biggest needs inside of gum of breath freshening was a little bit less relevant. People were talking to their screens. So there was a lot of different, there were ups and there were downs as well in terms of how, how the pandemic, pandemic played out both in terms of needs, but also in terms of our brands. Mm. That's great. I would love to follow up a little bit on and understanding that a little bit, a bit, bit better. And I, I bet the audience uh, is very interested in that as well. You have used a word uh, earlier called the hot zone. So uh, many of Mondelez's products are sold right. in these hot zones in uh, at a retailer. And then with the pandemic and probably also with kind of sustained change in shopping behavior mm -hmm. after the pan pandemic, um, uh, how have you thought through kind of the recreation of or the alternative to or to, to the hot zones in, in different channels than the traditional channels? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Through our, we, we, we run an internal tracker of COVID and trying to understand how consumers' behaviors are in terms of needs, um, but also in terms of their shopping behaviors. And we found in that study that seven out of 10 um, respondents said that they wanted to sustain their pandemic shopping behavior um, moving forward. I mean, examples of that would be, you know, obviously shopping online, um, different shopping uh, missions that we've seen. Uh, some countries that had never shopped online, um, now all of a sudden is. So in the case of Italy, which was Hard, hit hardest in the earlier parts of the pandemic. You know, shopping online was not a was not a common area, but now all of a sudden it's become much more of a sustainable thing because people have had the chance to trial and they feel safe with it, they feel comfortable with it, mm -hmm. um, and the delivery areas are so good now that actually they feel that they can. But that that places some some challenges on some of our brands on on for the brands that are on the shopping list. It's, it's, you're almost insulated in terms of um, the challenges of it because you're automatic, you become up, you, you become part of the search feed, you're part of the previous list of shopping things. So it's, it's a lot easier if you are a household name like an Oreo or a Cadbury. But if you are a, a brand that's considered much more an impulse type of purchase, and when we talk about the hot zone, that's sort of the area where right by the till, where as, you're, as, you're, as your goods are being um, cashed up, you simply make a, an impulse decision. That's obviously where the chocolates are, where the gums and candies are, um, where drinks are. And that, whether you're online or offline, had, had challenges to it. Because for the gum category, that's where half of the sales take place, is right in that moment of, of impulse. And um, the, the, the aisle itself has been challenged because the hot zone has shrunk as um, people are buying more online. So they're no longer exposed to, um, to, a, to a hot zone um, in the digital world per se. 
Um, it's also shrunk in the stores itself as people are going to more self-checkouts. That area, that idleness of sitting around waiting for your goods to be cashed up no longer is there because you're the cashier. So you're actively involved mm -hmm. in it. So your, your opportunity to browse what might be sitting in, those, in that area has become much smaller. Those spaces have become smaller. And, and that's obviously created a challenge for some of our gum brands, whereas we're starting to think about how do we create a digital hot zone? Um, what is the way in which we, we interrupt path to purchase um, throughout the cycle uh, with friendly reminders? Uh, I think the key for us is to make sure that, that the way people buy online is, is as frictionless and as seamless as possible between awareness all the way through to trial. And, and we, are, we are experimenting with a lot more of our own um, ways of approaching versus going through retailers. Um, but obviously, a little bit under wraps right now, but we are, we are planning something interesting in, in, on one of our brands um, in terms of our own, our own way of, of reaching consumers directly. Right, and that's an incredibly important, interesting topic here. So the more kind of you can, how do you think about the, the brand experience now across, uh, across the different channels? So it's always been complicated and difficult yep. to do, uh, do this across different channels, but it seems like uh, now it's uh, exploded and we've gotten even, even more difficult uh, to think about that brand experience across different channels. So how do yep. you, is it possible to kind of start replicating some of the work that you have done in store and now that more and more of this is, uh, is, is uh, moving, moving online and there are multiple touch points to the consumer before they actually make the purchase? Yep. Well, I mean, I think the interesting thing is, is as, as the pandemic now, I would say almost matures in some of the markets and as, as, as um, folks get out more, we are seeing a, a return back to the retail environment as well. Um, so make no mistake, it's still the biggest part of our purchasing cycle, but it's obviously the development of e-com has taken what, 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 uh, what we've done in one year through, through, um, through the pandemic has, has taken 10 to 15 years of what would have happened naturally. So there is definitely that acceleration, but it's still, and, and we are in Mondelez experiencing a significant amount of growth in that area. It's one of the, one of the one of the tailwinds that we have, the challenge is 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 as I said before, making sure that you are suitable for the environment. So making sure that you are either a on that shopping list, or b um, cleverly positioning yourself in throughout the page. So when we think about it in an in-store environment, you you're obviously wanting to get strong share of shelf, and you're wanting to get strong off-shelf displays, and that drives your awareness. I think in the case of, um, of, of driving awareness on, on, on social um, or on um, e-com, it's more about driving um, awareness around the banners, around the sides, um, working with retailers to get to um, you know, good co-promotions. It's mm -hmm. much more important to focus on packaging and the appeal of your claims. And even going down as low as, as some of the areas of making sure that the descriptors of your products and the descriptors therein help yield better search results. So it's about treating visibility differently in, 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 that, in, in, in an offline versus an online retail environment. And in that also curious, can, any differences between the millennial, millennial snacking and the, and the rest of us? Uh, Oreo cookies is the default on my shopping, uh, shopping list. We got me, uh, got, we got me covered. Uh, but any differences you see here between the millennial snacking and, and, and the rest of us? Well, actually, you're very interesting. I mean, what we do know is millennials and across the markets, it varies, but they generally snack, snack more. Um, yeah. up to 25% more. Um, that's because of a couple of things. Um, their day structure is, is changing and is different. Um, so they don't, they're not as stronger believers in the three meals of the day. They much more prefer to snack on the go. Um, the other thing is you've got to put yourself in their, in their state of life. I mean, millennials are now 25 to 40 years old. So they are young parents. Um, so that drives totally different behavior. I think anybody who's been a parent knows that they <laughs> tend to snack alongside their children most of the times. The other thing that it does is it drives the change in their needs. Um, often it's uh, snacking to escape, snacking to have that small indulgence because they are you know, around you know, children most of the time. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about millennials is that their ability to 
to want much more um, healthier, even though it's indulgent, they want a healthier claim behind indulgence. So the snack type that they're choosing, the snack brand that they're choosing is very important. Um, they typically um, express much more desire for snacks that can de-stress them, that can uplift them. Um, and they're also one of the most connected in terms of digital savviness, but they can also be one of the most lonely cohorts um, in terms of isolation as well. So there's a lot of that, there's a lot of emotional snacking that tends to happen um, with, with millennials. But what they deem important, interestingly enough, in terms of brands is uh, transparency, that you know what goes into the brands, you know what the brand stands for, you know that the brand is inherently good in terms of its ethos. Um, well-being is important, so making sure that it has, even though it's indulgent, it may still have, you know, pure cane sugar, or Himalayan salt, you know, it's, it's not just um, smaller, simpler ingredients, they're wanting much more um, exotic ingredients as well. Um, they, of course, want things that are good for the planet. Um, mm -hmm. That's an far, by far increased need. And they're seeking brands that have a purpose, um, that stand for something. Mm -hmm. And in that, I, uh, that topic I care a lot about. And the, um, in that, how do you actually kind of ensure that it's genuine? You talked about kind of transparency mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, but kind of, kind of how, how do you, how do, how do you, what are some examples you've seen if you've seen something that hasn't, hasn't been genuine or have, if you've seen that uh, it was kind of mostly a marketing message, but behind the curtain, there was actually not that much of a change that had, had, had happened to the product. Um, but, and what, right. what are the products where it is truly genuine and the consumers, they understand that it's genuine. Um, right. Have you, what, what, yeah, how do you walk I mean, that I, line successfully? I'm a bit hesitant to name specific brands, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I will talk to certain types. Um, I think um, purpose is a very slippery fish. Um, I think we have to treat it very carefully. And the reason I say that it is very easy for consumers to spot if you're paying lip service. Yeah. Um, many brands, particularly around areas around um, diversity and inclusion, um, whether it was Black Lives Matter at one stage, you know, which was hit during the same time as the as, as pandemic, um, immediately resorted to changing their copy, changing their cre their talent in their ads, to suddenly change the diversity of it. And and I think people can see through that. They mm -hmm. see all of a sudden you had a a family that was one way, and then a, and then another way. And I think it doesn't. It's not genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there is even you know accounts in terms of. The way the way um, consumers are, are almost laughing at some brands that are trying to do it. They call one right. was called rainbow washing. You know, where every brand suddenly wanted to jump on LGBTQ rights, and people look through it and they say, "Well, you know, thank you, but you know, where were you before? And what stands? What what makes your brand stand for something versus just deciding that this is a trending theme?" And we want to um, and we want to hop on the bandwagon. So I think consumers are are, are very aware of when that happens. Um, so the best brand examples that I've seen where there is um, a true fit to the brand and a genuine need for for to help, um, I think is where where it comes to life. Um, some of them are as simple as uh, like Nature Valley, one of our competitors, um, really focusing heavily on recyclability aiming for 2025 uh, complete recyclability that ties so well to the brand because the brand is a is a is a is a is a on the go bar it's a snacking bar it's usually used as a tray uh, you know if you're going hiking you know so it's a very real need in terms of disposal of the product um, other areas are, are are you know some of the brands that stand for outdoors like REI you know getting to a net zero um, carbon footprint or even some of some of the like the UK brand Brewdog, um, which is mm -hmm. a, a, you know going towards a, a negative um, uh, uh, footprint. So in other words, giving back even more than than what they said. Um, an interesting new one, which I think is a turnaround for the brand, was was Barbie under Mattel. Um, was historically seen to be all about um, driving the wrong kind of body um, impression for young girls. Now all of a sudden has dolls that. Um, have vitilago or that have um, that are um, disabled dolls. So really trying to broaden the, the the appeal of what body what body messaging should be. 
Um, in our own camp, I think a really good one that was extremely touching for us is, is under the Cad Cadbury brand. Um, uh, throughout the Diwali in India, um, Cadbury, which is has the heart of generosity, um, launched the most generous ad, which which used realized that during the case of a severe lockdowns during uh, in in India's um, heaviest part of its pandemic, all of their shops, which are all traditional trade retailers, um, had lost most of their business. So tried to find a way to try and help them. So they created an advertise an advertisement that basically used geo mapping and based on where people were watching the ad, pinned their location to the nearest, whether it was an optometrist or a dentist, as part of the Cadbury messaging, or whether it was a jeweler or a watchmaker, uh, and they they basically created one of the first types of ads that was using unique combinations, so many combinations that actually we lost count. Of how many different different uh, combinations were being were being created using you know very smart data geo mapping but with a message that says that you know this business is right here it's right down your road here is its name on TV you know to try and drive up businesses around them not just to drive Cadbury sales around them and they were unrelated to to Cadbury as well so I think that that generosity approach um, to me speaks to a brand that's generally trying to help the environment and help help the community um, beyond and, and showing up, trying to actually physically be there mm -hmm. versus just pay lip service. Mm -hmm. Great, well, that's excellent. Uh, terrific insight on a challenging topic for many, many marketers. Um, yeah. But um, on the inter international side, you touched on a couple of them um, already, but uh, would love to hear more of the differences internationally and snack, snacking trends is uh, dark chocolate, uh, uh, a global trend that uh, happens everywhere or what do you see in within the kind of snacking uh, in the category and also the fresh versus packaged and uh, your view on on, on trends uh, globally. I would, uh, would love, to, uh, love, love to hear yeah. a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I think it's fascinating because, you know, work, when we work in a global role, we like to see the world in one way, but what we know <laughs> just with consumers is that it's not. What we see is a real blend and probably one of the easiest ways to explain it is the emerging versus developed market dynamic because consumers react to their day parts. So if you take certain parts of the world are early to bed, early to rise, so they snack more in the morning, those are, those are the emerging markets, the Philippines, India, Brazil. Um, but then when you get towards the developed markets, um, they are much more into the evening, evening type of snacking. And their needs are slightly different where emerging markets are much more around fuel and fortification and energy and sustenance when you get towards the the way um, consumers snack in Europe or in the U.S., it's much more about it's much more the emotional side. It's about indulgence, relaxation, de-stressing. Um, so we we see a, a big difference in terms of how people snack throughout the day. I mean, the average time in which someone snacks, the heightened time, um, evolves. We also see the trends come from different places, but also um, are heightened in certain places. So, for example, you spoke about the bakery. Um, trend. That's much more of a, a developed market trend, per se. Um, it's one of the areas where consumers are wanting to have, again, more transparency, more of that feeling of freshly baked, whereas in emerging markets, making sure the product is durable still remains a very important need. Um, and fresh baked goods are normally, you know, the very basics. It's very basic breads, etc., which are which are considered sort of standard. So, you can kind of see the difference and you spoke about chocolate or dark chocolate. The same is true. Um, it depends on a couple of things, whether or not the market itself is a chocolate market because we're brand, uh, brands have built categories around the world. So in Europe, chocolate has been very successful and it's the number one snack that people go to when they think about indulgence. Whereas in the US, there wasn't necessarily a chocolate maker that built the category. So it typically the first go to for for the for US consumers is to go to cookies. Um, so that also develops a different taste profile in Europe. It's much more about darker chocolate, um, which is which is a trend. It's it's typically healthier. It's consumed by older consumers. They typically like the more bitter taste profile than younger consumers. So there's more of an age demographic there that's that's impacting on that trend. 
Whereas in the US, chocolate is still sort of much more mass and, and is now, you know, amongst premium, uh, amongst, amongst high income consumers, the premium area is really starting to take off and you're finding a lot more, again, talking back to that trend of, of say wealthier millennials that are purchasing, um, that want much more transparent packaging. They want much more artisanal chocolate. That's where dark chocolate is, is, is taking off more um, in the US. Terrific. I think uh, both me and the, the rest of the audience here could, could, could listen to you for, for, a lot, for, for a lot more miles. Your insights here are uh, across both channels and, uh, and trends and global uh, here is, uh, is, is truly, truly, truly amazing. So but I think we are up on time, unfortunately. So as we turn this back over to uh, brand innovator, innovators, uh, just wishing you good luck in your new role and look forward to hearing more what, uh, what, what, what you and, and uh, Mandela have up uh, of coming out thank you very much Ari, and it's uh, it was a pleasure chatting with you and, and and the team today all right we have there with jesse perfect hey guys how's it going I uh, really like that and I like, uh, I can just say your research team, Miles, is doing a great job because I'm like on that millennial spectrum and I absolutely <laughs> all day long. That is <laughs>